Okay, well, I know we're getting to the end of the day, so I'll keep it short. And in fact, I've decided I'm not going to do my presentation because otherwise you all fall asleep. Because I've, <laughs> I've been an academic for the last three years, and I think uh, that, um, you know, means that I should do a bit of a shift and get you all to wake up, and I'll just go back to my original being a storyteller, which is being a filmmaker. So I'll tell you a little story and take it from there. We'll see how we go. Um, it starts actually in um, 14th of February 1991. Uh, was Valentine's Day and m was my first day coming here into Australia. And it wasn't on the Patricia <laughs> at that time. <laughs> it was on a Qantas flying kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> so different times. Um, and um, different times also meant that you know I came from a country uh, where we all spoke English, and so I spoke fluent English the first day I arrived, although I came from Jordan, which is an Arabic-speaking country. But, you know, I've done my studies in English, and I came. I also uh, means also not being that your typical uh, immigrant. I came as a reluctant immigrant. You know, I had a good life there. I was, you know, an activist. I was the head of the film society and uh, happy social life and didn't want to come, but there was the time was the Gulf War. So I had to kind of run and come to Australia. Funnily enough, little side story, on the way to Australia, I ended up sitting next to a lady who worked in the American embassy in, in Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> and she had come here to Australia to surprise her American boyfriend who worked in the American embassy in Australia for Valentine's Day. And so we spent the trip chatting and talking about you know, the war and about coming to a new country and uh, me, you know, in this kind of wide-eyed, um, slightly reluctant coming to a new country, um, she ended up falling asleep on my shoulder <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe people here are friendly and so, yeah. <laughs> but that was my only experience of someone falling on my asleep on my shoulder on a plane. Since then, 23 years, lots of trouble didn't happen again. <laughs> Um, uh, I came here and uh, I, you know, I had uh, choices like many immigrants do. You know, you could uh, uh, really decide to stay nostalgic and have that kind of cultural freeze and, you know, just live in the past. And, you know, I know many people that do that and 20 years on, they go to back to their country of origin and they still think it's the same, but they get the big shock. And so that's one way to do it. And then... There's obviously another way which my, many of my siblings have done is totally assimilate and, you know, uh, even, you know, when asked where you're from, they'll say I'm Australian. And for me, whenever I'm, I'm asked where, where I'm from, I'll say, you know, I'm Australian of Palestinian background. Um, so I didn't do the total assimilation. I chose not to do that. I also didn't take that cultural freeze and say, look, I am uh, still living in the past. And also, I didn't take that other thing, which I think a lot of people put uh, as a connotation to multiculturalism, and I'm mentioning that because that kind of leads me to where I'm heading. Uh, I didn't also f kind of get into, uh, into my group and just listen to, my, to the ethnic media and just you know, uh, feel a little bit kind of scared of being part of the wider community. So what I did is I integrated, but I also kept bits of me and in fact I tried to enforce bits of you know my culture into Australia by, by you know b doing activities and, and going sometimes even going in the streets and you know I, at one stage I got frustrated so I went and did this street activism where I put the kufiya which is the Arabic thing and I had some coffee Arabic coffee and I went in Martin place and I sat down and I just said coffee with a Palestinian and I just offered coffee for people to have a chat <laughs> Because I, because I felt I felt the only way to actually connect is do that, because I couldn't do it through the media, I couldn't do it through anything, so I thought I'm going to go to the streets and do it. So this leads me to the next thing, which is jumping to the future, which is social media. And this has uh, kind of been my forte in the last 10 years and working hard on trying to find ways to create a communication through social media. I think that... What I'm finding in my research, and I, I you know, I've went a, a, again to my word, and I went and started something, and I started a thing, a campaign called Talking Cultures. So you can check that if, if you want, talkingcultures.org, at some stage. The idea of the campaign is to get to talk, get people talking, 
and get people talking in a positive way, but there lies a problem with talking in a positive way. This problem is that, um, according to research and according also to what I found, is that the, the positive contact does not create strong engagement. What creates strong, strong engagement is negative. So what happens is that you might have 20 positive experiences that will generate less momentum and less noise than one negative experience. That's a big problem. That's like a hard slog for someone that's trying to put a positive spin around things. I think that's, that's one of the biggest problems. And that problem kind of even gets amplified on social media because what happens with social media is that the, lo the level of engagement is very low. And so what, it, what you end up with is that negative messages uh, totally uh, get to the top. And the reason that they get to the top because they come with higher engagement. People get excited about negative messages and they contribute. For example, uh, just to give you a, an actual specific example, is I went to the streets asking people about multiculturalism. And so I videoed people asking questions. And then I went and got other people to answer these questions. I put that on social media. And what I found, interestingly, is that people only engage with the negative questions or the negative answers. And it's kind of sad because there was some really like interesting uh, debate that was happening that is positive out of what I, the people I spoke to on the streets. But the ones that were getting views, the ones that were getting comments, definitely the negative ones. So you put a negative video and you get 20 comments on YouTube. Uh, you put a positive video and you might get five likes, but not comments, likes, lower level of engagement. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the biggest issue that we need to tackle. Now I'm, you know, I'm just giving you the problem, but there are solutions. It's not a dead end in terms of how can we tackle this. And because we are thinking about the future, we need to think about ways to create a, a positive environment where we can celebrate cultural diversity. I think, um, you know, back to the academic thing, I think the main, the main problem is that authority needs to start with that. People in, on author in a place of authority is the ones that need to start creating that positive connection because uh, that assailance of engagement increases highly if people in authority give a positive message. It might even be able to equate with the negative messages that can happen without authority. So if you see what I mean, we're fighting a lost battle if, we, if the negative message is the one that's always out there without having people that, that can weigh in, people with authority that can weigh in and get a positive message. Uh, I'll give you an example without mentioning names. This is my second hat, the filmmaker. Uh, I go to ABC and I meet someone without mentioning their name. <laughs> <laughs> that someone um, had met me because I've already done stuff for the ABC and I've won awards for them. And so they know I'm, you know, I'm an established filmmaker. And so I came in with an idea. And my idea uh, was about a project that I've done before about child refugee and I wanted to see, I was done for the ABC and it won lots of awards. I wanted to see if the ABC can give me a chance to do a 10 years on and see what's happening to these refugees. Okay, so the answer is as follows. It would be great if some of them turned, turned criminals. <laughs> that is the exact answer. That was the exact answer. It would be great if some of them turned criminals and that would make a, an interesting story for the ABC. Then I went back and I said, like, I answered that, and I said, like, I countered that, and I said, look, what we need is also look at these as a success stories in the community. Okay. So the answer back came back is that ABC Charter is from all Australians, so it's not about ethnic communities. Go to SPS. <laughs> now, there's two problems lie in this, two problems. One is that it says that we only want negative messages about, you know, multicultural Australia, which is a big problem. But the second problem, which I think is even bigger, and it goes back to Natalie was talking about the integration of mainstream, and it goes, it's, it's a big problem, is that there's a misconception of what mainstream Australia is. You know, like mainstream Australia is, is not just about white Australia. Mainstream Australia is about also ethnic stories. You know, in my, and I think Mandy mentioned something about SBS uh, wanting to bring the, the mainstream Australia to the multilingual, uh, ethnic communities. I think that that is a good way to, for like for something like SBS to work. And the other way around is ABC should be bringing the ethnic stories to the mainstream Australia. So if you actually if your charter is mainstream, then that should include 
the ethnic communities because they are part of mainstream. After all, we are talking about integration, about creating a, a you know, a homogeneous, like a, a, a celebrated multicultural community. So I think that there is two big problems that need to be solved. And if they do get solved, then we will have people in authority creating a positive mes message. I mean, there's another side problem, which is training uh, heritage media into uh, dealing with social media and understanding how, how can we utilize it to reach a wider audience, you know. And I think uh, in that problem, it's, it's about understanding that you know, uh, the issue of engagement is not just about engaging people, but it's, it's also about the level of that engagement. And how can we engage people in a level that can create a shift? And what I mean by a shift is that it can give value to culture. You know, if you can give value to culture, to culture, and if you can make, like multiculturalism, not a question about the many cultures living in Australia, but about how Australia can be defined by its rich cultures and by, by these many cultures, then if we can get to that stage through the authority, and, and that authority can only happen is through educating you know, the, our big, big media uh, into understanding the importance of positive cultural diversity. If we can get to that, then we can actually access social media in a better way, and we can get our younger generation to engage. You know, and if, you, if we get ethnic communities and younger generation to engage, then they're not alienated. And then we, are, and then we get to a stage where we can create a, 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 like people that are integrated, but at the same time proud of their heritage. Because at the moment, you don't get that choice. You don't get that choice to be both. You get the choice to say, okay, well, I, fine, I'm gonna integrate, but I'm gonna have to hide my heritage because it's not celebrated. Or, no, I'm, I'm gonna be angry and I'm gonna, get secluded into my little corner. Mm -hmm. So having these choices are not necessarily good. And that's why I think we have to do that paradigm shift of what is multiculturalism. I think th that's a big question. And you know, in, in, my, in my modest answer, I think uh, we have a chance with social media because social media is a place where you can have connections, but also where you can have content and also where you can build community. So if you can do these three things, connect people in a positive way, have content from places of authority, real content that celebrates diversity, then you can create a community that is vibrant, that has value to culture. And I'll end here. Thank you.